Yeah. Um, the topic is Chinese, mainland, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the United States. My name is Adiola Fayemi, and I oversee the International Cultural Center in the Office of International Programs. This lunch seminar is one of the signature programs hosted by the International Cultural Center. We create every time an informal lunch forum to educate and sensitize our campus community about important international affairs, intercultural issues such as politics in Brazil, uprising in the Sudan, comparative cultural diversity in Canada, or the commemoration of the International Women's Day with a representative of the consulate here in Auburn with us. We engage our faculty, students, and, and staff, and the wider urban community in civil discourse about international issues to continue the process of internationalizing the campus and preparing our students to be culturally competent global citizens in an increasingly competitive world. I am sure that you will agree with me that today's topic is very timely current news. And most of us need to be able to truly understand the history and dynamics so that after this lecture, we can continue an objective campus-wide conversation, not just about this topic, but about other important international issues to further our understanding of the world and continue the process of internationalizing at home within our campus. Now it's time for me to introduce our distinguished moderator for this session. But before I do that, I would like to address some housekeeping issues. First, you should have sign-in sheets on your table. It's the blue one. Please make sure that you sign uh, before you leave so we can keep in touch with you after this. Secondly, you should have sign-up sheets. Those are the deep yellow sheets on the table. Today is the first day of the conversation but it will not be the last. We plan to continue the conversation. Please sign up to continue the conversation after the talk today. We will establish small dialogue groups for this purpose within the next few days. I will encourage you to sign up and make new connections, share important insights, and make a difference in the world. Thirdly, there should be Q and A cards or post-it um, little notes. I think they're yellow. In order to make the Q&A session go very smoothly after the talk and to accommodate all the questions, please write your questions and put it to the side near you. Our team members will come around to pick them up and hand them to the moderator for the question and answer session. We hope to be able to take additional questions at the end of this session. Also, our speaker will stay around for a while if you have additional questions. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this session. Our moderator is Dr. Maurice L. Ben, who received his PhD from the University of Washington and joined Auburn University History Faculty in 1998. Dr. Bien's work has been extensively published, including one that actually piqued my interest, titled The Making of the State Enterprise System in Modern China, The Dynamics of Institutional Change, actually published by Harvard University Press. I'm going to read that after. <laughs> Dr. Bien's research focuses on enduring questions of the Chinese Revolution of 1949. His current project creates a synthesis of the two opposing views surrounding the Chinese Revolution. He is the past president of the Historical Society for 20th Century China and a member of the editorial board of the Chinese Historical Review. Please uh, join me in welcoming a distinguished faculty member Proudly one of us, Dr. Maurice Bien.
Thank you, <coughs> Dr. Uh, Fiammi, for that uh, uh, wonderful uh, introduction. Before I uh, I'll take the opportunity uh, to uh, introduce uh, our um, distinguished uh, guest uh, speaker, uh, I'd like just to uh, reinforce uh, what, what uh, Dr. Uh, Fiamme uh, just uh, mentioned, uh, and that is to say that uh, one of our goals uh, at, at, at Auburn uh, is to make our students uh, informed and hopefully engaged uh, citizens of the United States and the world. And, and I think uh, you know, the topic uh, we have today uh, is a uh, wonderful fit uh, uh, to that uh, uh, important uh, mission of the uh, university. Now, it is my uh, great honor uh, to uh, introduce uh, our uh, speaker uh, today, uh, Dr. Feiling Wang. Dr. Uh, Feiling Wang uh, received uh, his uh, PhD uh, from the University of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, he's a professor at the uh, Sam Nan School of uh, Communication Affairs, excuse me, uh, Sam Nan School of International Affairs uh, at uh, George Tech uh, or George Institute of uh, Technology. Uh, his research interests are comparative and international political economy, uh, U.S. East Asian relations, and East Asia and China uh, studies. I'd like to uh, point out the fact that uh, uh, Dr. Wang is a leading international scholar of international relations, international political economy, especially Chinese political economy. Uh, he has published a total of uh, seven books, uh, including two edited uh, volumes. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of his uh, single authored books uh, is entitled uh, Organization Through Division and Exclusion, China's Hukou System. Hukou means uh, household registration, so the household uh, registration uh, system, which was published uh, by Stanford University Press uh, in 2005. Uh, it's uh, a uh, groundbreaking study. Uh, it, it has become a classic uh, uh, so far as uh, this uh, extremely important and, and, and unique uh, Chinese uh, system of uh, household uh, registration system uh, is concerned. And, and more recently, uh, he published another um, important uh, uh, book uh, entitled The Chinese Order, Centralia, World Empire, and the Nature of Chinese uh, Power uh, by Sunni Press uh, that was published in 2017. And the book has been translated uh, into uh, Chinese, uh, both in its uh, simplified, uh, simplified uh, well, the, 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 the two different, uh, you know, uh, written uh, systems of Chinese. One is called, uh, you know, um, Fan tzu or, or complicated, one is jian uh, or sim uh, you know, simplicated or so simple characteristic. I can't really uh, you know, have a, a good uh, uh, description of it. But anyway, it has been translated uh, into uh, Chinese and, and has been cited uh, so many times and uh, has become a required reading, uh, not just in classrooms, in, but in some other important contexts. Dr. Wang has also published dozens of book uh, chapters and journal articles in four different languages. He taught at the U.S. Uh, Military Academy at uh, West Point uh, and held uh, visiting uh, positions in institutions like European University in Institute, uh, Science Po in France, uh, National University of uh, Singapore, uh, National Taiwan University, Renmin University of China, and Anhui Normal University in China, Uni University of Tokyo in Japan, U.S. Air Force uh, Academy, and uh, Sun, uh, Sun Kuen, I can't say this uh, Korean word, uh, Sun Kuen Kwan University and Yonsei University in Korea. Uh, Dr. Wang has also appeared uh, in many national and international news medias, uh, media such as uh, Al Jazeera, AP, BBC, CNN, uh, Radio China International, The Financial Times, The New York Times, uh, The Voice of America, South China Morning Post, uh, The Wall Street Journal, and the Xinhua News Agency. Uh, he has had numerous research grants, including uh, uh, a Minerva uh, Chair Grant, uh, a Fulbright Senior Scholar Grant, and a Hitaji uh, Fellowship. And he's also a member of the uh, 
prestigious uh, institution uh, called Council of uh, Foreign Relations, uh, an organization that includes uh, former U.S. presidents and, and, and uh, secretaries of state and, and so on. Well, without uh, further ado, uh, I shall now turn the podium to Dr. Wang. All right. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Morris, for the very kind introduction. I want to thank Dr. Fayami. I want to thank uh, Wei. And I want to thank this uh, wonderful institution for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, this is an institution I've heard of for many, many years, but I have never had a chance to visit. Now I see it's a great place, and the people are wonderful here. Everybody I met so far is wonderful. Um, so I understand that my assignments to share with you in the next five hours, I'm just kidding, uh, <laughs> about uh, my understanding of Chinese mainland, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the United States. So I will, um, I actually I've already prepared quite a few slides, but before I get started, I want to make a disclaimer. I was born in southern China, and I've spent quite a few years in southern USA. So I'm really, really a real southerner. Uh, <laughs> So if, I, uh, if my thick southern accent got in the way, you couldn't understand me, I will try to put back my Yankee accent, right? <laughs> which I picked up uh, since I spent quite a few years in the north, uh, in the Yankee territory. But I'd be more than happy, of course, to talk in Mandarin as well, in the standard Chinese pronunciation. So kidding aside, but if you have any questions, if I lost you guys in the middle of the way, raise your hand. I'd be happy to sing and dance for you guys uh, to get the point across. Anyway, I prepared a few slides, but we'll see how much we can cover. Uh, and I really, really want to hear from you. So I will try to leave some time at the end to do the Q&A. And as Dr. Fayami mentioned, I'd be more than happy to stay behind for a little while if you have questions after the uh, program, right? And uh, by the way, I think this is a wonderful kind of design to have this kind of opportunity to sort of have uh, faculty and students sit together to talk about issues of the day and to get ourselves familiarized, familiarized with what's going on in the world. This is wonderful. This is something that wonderful educational institutions is all about, right? So I'm really, really happy to be a small part of that. So hopefully I will not let you down too much today. All right, so this is my outline of uh, my uh, talk today. I want briefly to mention a few what I consider basic facts regarding U.S. and China uh, to you. Uh, I would love to use this as a time to quiz our students. How much do you know about U.S. and China, right? We'll see. And then I will be happy to talk about a little bit Taiwan, the different interpretation about, of Taiwan, and also the cross-strait relationship between Taiwan and Chinese mainland. And then, of course, Hong Kong which is very much in the news lately, right? Of course, this is not going to be a news analysis, but uh, just a little way to inform, hopefully, the audience here about what's going on in, Ta in Hong Kong and what does it mean. And finally, I'd be more than happy to talk about something I'm currently working on, the Sino-American relations. What is transpiring uh, over the Pacific, so to speak, between two great nations, right? Uh, right now and in the years ahead. So we'll see how much we can cover. Right. First, China, the name. As the very wise man Confucius said over 2,000 years ago, if you don't have a good name, you're not going to accomplish anything. Right. Name is very important. In today's uh, language, we call concepts are important. Right. How to conceptualize a thing is always the first step of studying something. Right. So what is the name of China? You all know China is a, word, is, is a name we use to describe the east part of the Eurasian continent for a long time, right? In most languages, we use China. But probably you don't know that the name of China comes from an ancient kingdom in China that once united a whole area of China called Qing. So China comes from China, Qing. It does not come from the word describing porcelain. Actually, it's the other way around, right? We call China China today is because it was first produced in China, not because China is known for producing porcelain. That's a different kind of uh, uh, twist. But in today's Chinese language, we Chinese don't talk about China, don't call China China at all. We call it Zhongguo, meaning central country, right? The centralia idea, right? Middle country idea, which has nothing to do with China or Qing. So there's discrepancy in terms of naming. 
of China, we have two interpretations to start with, right? The world has one view when it's about China, oh, what a nice porcelain, or ancient kingdom. But when Chinese say Zhongguo, we mean central country, middle country, very different, mind you. So that's a little kind of uh, uh, difference, right? Of course, in Chinese history, we have had other wonderful names, Han, Tang, for example, the great dynasties that are symbols of the wonderful culture of Chinese civilization. So therefore, sometimes we use the Qin or Han or Tang to refer to China. So the very word China was translated back to China, Chinese in eighth century by a few Buddhist monks when they went to India, discovered in Sanskrit, Sanskrit, the country they came from, at that time's Tang was called China, China. So they translated it back called Zhizna. So Zhizna was actually Chinese translation. But as you all know, in Chinese language, this word Zhizna is uh, not very kind of a complimentary, put that way. It's a little bit like a branches, right? <coughs> kind of not too glamorous. So in the 20th century, especially after the 1930s, when the Japanese invaded China, they used the word Zhizna to call China. The ancient Chinese translation, the Chinese all become really offended. So we don't want Zhizna at all. So today in China, we don't use Zhizna. We don't use the phonetic translation of China anymore. We use Zhongguo, right, instead of uh, just phonetic translation of Zhizna. Only in one place in today's Chinese language, we keep the word Zhizna alive. Where? Indochina. The word Indochina translated into Chinese is not called Indo Zhongguo. It's still called Indo Zhizna. That's the only place we still have that. Other than that, Zhizna is a bad word. We don't want that, right? So that's kind of a naming thing, right? Now, the place. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I, I understand that uh, uh, I probably over prepared anyway. Um, I'm going to mention to you the size and location of China, right? Let me do a little bit of geography test here. Which country, in terms of uh, territory size, is bigger? U.S. or PRC or China? Any takers? Which country is bigger? <laughs> yes, sir. China. Anybody else? So that's the uh, consensus. China bigger. China. Consensus. U.S. U.S. All right. This is all about democracy, right? Different views. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Russia is the biggest. Russia is the biggest. That's true. That's true. <laughs> clearly, clearly, clearly. Oh, this is another one. China. All right. So if we vote in a democratic fashion, China seems bigger. Because there's three voices for China, one for US, one for Russia. Well, it doesn't really count, right, in this case. But unfortunately, truth, as always, rests with the minority, right? In this case, US actually is larger. Why the difference? People who graduated from Chinese schools, like I myself, always believe China is larger than the United States, right? But in fact, China is smaller than the United States. Taiwan doesn't count, actually. Taiwan coming back doesn't really make a difference. What's the difference? The difference is a huge chunk of territory. The Chinese are called Zhangnan, and Indians called uh, uh, Abunash Paradish. It's an Indian state that's under Indian control, China claims for its own. That territory, that piece of territory, is nine times larger than Taiwan. That makes a difference, all right? In other words, in reality, US is larger, but perceptional-wise, we think China is larger. There you go. Another fact of conflict, contradictions, right? All right, location. I want to make an important point here for you to hopefully take away, or uh, we can debate about it. I think ecology and location really shape people's mind, right, uh, greatly. So Chinese location, the location of a country China or Zhongguo, really shapes how Chinese view themselves and view the world, right? So. The Chinese has a traditional view called Da Yi Tong, or Tian Xia idea, meaning all under heaven are to be united together, right? So for eons, for centuries, Chinese believe they have already united the whole world. The whole world there is, China. Beyond that, ah, insignificant barbarians, basically, right? Uh, so therefore, they call Japan the place sun rises. Would Japanese call their own homeland where the sun rises? Of course not. Because for the Japanese, where the sun rises? It's in the east, Hawaii, right? Not in Japan. So the very name of Japan comes from China. 
The Chinese people say, oh, you got too east, kind of remote. That's where the sun rises, right? So that's the world is defined by the location of China, right? Take a look at this map, right? You'll see the ancient, for the ancient Chinese people, they truthfully believe, they genuinely believe they have reached the end of the world, right? To the east, the biggest pound on planet Earth, the Pacific. Usually it's a one way travel. You go out, right? You don't come back live. To the north, frozen Siberia. Not so much there. If you march northward, usually also one way trip. You don't come back. <laughs> to the west, world's second and third largest desert and world tallest mountains, the Tibetan Plateau. Usually also one way trip. You don't come back to tell a lie. To the south, tropical jungles and deadly diseases, malaria. In Chinese, we call zhang qi, like poison gas, right? So therefore, we, the Chinese, in the ancient time, truthfully believe we reached the end of the world. Nothing really significant beyond, right? That led to the formation of the idea the world is all here, and the world ought to be united for a variety of purposes, a variety of reasons, right? So the world unification idea is very deep in the Chinese mind, the tianxia idea. We want to take care of the whole world the same way, we want to run the whole world the same way. It's, this is determined by geography, by ecology. In terms of ecology, there is a rainfall line uh, dividing China in two parts, the eastern and the west, right? And this rainfall line incidentally also is a dividing line of Chinese demography, right? To the east of this line, territorial-wise, China is about 40% of Chinese territory. To the west of the line is 6% of Chinese territory. <coughs> but guess what? Majority, overwhelming majority of Chinese people always live on the east side, right? What's the majority? In 1920s, was 96%. In 1980s, was 93%. Today, you may be wondering, so what about today? Today is highly mobile now. We move west and so on. Today, it's still 91.7% east of the line, right? That's why the kind of population density you see coming in China is always on the east side. West side, very sparsely populated. If you think Alabama is sparsely populated, Go to the west of, uh, of China. That's why you see that, right? Uh, east part is very condensed, right? That also created a kind of a dup, dup, double, uh, double concept of China. That is, China proper, that's where everything is. And the periphery, kind of uh, insignificant. But nowadays, of course, because technology become valuable, become important. Xinjiang, one-sixth of Chinese territory, was considered for a long time just a place that you could a photo to lose, <coughs> nothing significant. But now Xinjiang for the first time in Chinese history become economically valuable because natural resources, especially uh, oil and gas, right? So this is kind of different. Tibet is still considered economically wasteland. And the Chinese t uh, government is spending billions on Tibet. It's money losing kind of spending because you don't get much from Tibet. It's just high mountains, beautiful, breathtaking, literally breathtaking, very high, right? Uh, but you know, that's, that's it. But in the future, who knows? Tibet become, may become economically meaningful as well, right? That's the, in the future. Uh, one, one more thing I want to make, point out and we'll move on is the ethnic minority issue in China. This is where a lot of basics may not be known uh, on the first uh, cut, right? In China, officially, there are 50 some minority groups, I mean, ethnic groups. The Han, of course, is the majority. <laughs> but the Han, predominantly concentrated on the east one-third of the country, as you can see in the map here, right? The minority is very tiny. They all together is about six to seven percent of the population, but they are regionally concentrated in the west, in Tibet, for example, regionally concentrated. That create a politically challenging issue of separatism because they want a local autonomy. We are, we are local majority here, right? It's like in Georgia, Georgians are local majority here, the Yankees Get out, right? That's kind of idea. Um, I'm, I'm a bad joke. I mean, but you, you get a picture, basically. That's the idea, right? So that created a little issue here. Now, all right, we compared that already. In terms of a temperature location, this is where China is. B, it is middle to south of the United States. So U.S. is colder than than, than China uh, overall, right? All right. One more thing. In terms of uh, uh, resource endowment, China is actually rich. Right? It's all it's a big country. 
But compared to the United States, China is relatively resource poor in many ways. For one thing, the arable land in China, land you can grow stuff, in China is very small. It's only one third the size of the United States. What's the size of US population in comparison to America to Chinese population? Another quiz, right? In terms of uh, how big is US population in comparison to, to uh, Chinese population? One fourth. One fourth, right? You think about that. We have one fourth of population, three times as much arable land. So the United States is truly kind of blessed in a way, right, in terms of land alone, right? And also look at China. High mountains, deserts, and biggest pond. And look at America, right? The highest point of America here, I'm telling America, is a Pikes Peak in Colorado, which I climb, I mean, I didn't climb, I drove up. I'm kind of lazy. Uh, <laughs> Pikes Peak on Tibetan Plateau will be considered the lowest point in Tibetan Plateau, right? That's the location. And we have two, arguably three coastlines. China only had one, right? And that, China, that one coastline is easily sealed in by outside forces. So the Chinese traditionally felt they have been sealed in, especially since the 19th century, when Navy, modern Navy, become important, right? So that's just a little comparison between US and China, some kind of basics, right? Let's move on to another topic, the greater China. The mainland, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau. Those are the official flags of those places, right? And uh, we're going to talk about uh, very quickly, uh, uh, one by one. So first, let's talk about Taiwan. And this is Taiwan, right? Taiwan Island, the main island of Taiwan, is only, and the narrowest point here, is only 90 miles across. I don't, I don't know about Alabama. In Georgia, our drivers can make that in one hour. Yeah, no big deal, right? Only 90 miles, boom, you get there. So it's not too far away, right? It's very close, right? So that little distance, however, that little uh, water, however, has created a de facto kind of a independent country outside the greater China context. That's uh, the source of a lot of political troubles of our time and misunderstandings, right? So today's Taiwan uh, includes Taiwan, Penghu, Kimoi, or Jingmen, and Maju here, little offshore islands, right? That's the kind of on a different uh, political uh, system uh, and different governance. That's today Taiwan. That's, so we call it cross-strait relationship, referring to mainland Taiwan relationship, right? All right. This is a little flag you probably have seen before if you are following Olympic Games, right? This is a Taiwanese Olympic uh, flag that was approved and accepted by China, by PRC, in 1982, right? This was the com product of a compromise at the time to recognize Taiwan as a separate entity, but yet not a country, right? So therefore, they have an Olympic flag. But this Olympic flag does contain the ingredient of a Taiwanese national flag, if you will. Right, look at this Taiwanese national flag, this thing, right? It's in this. Accepting that back in 1982, a long time ago, before many of you guys were born, right, was one thing. But later on, it became an issue. So in 2008, when Beijing was hosting Olympic Games, <coughs> Beijing raised this issue with Taiwanese, said, no more flag like that. We don't like this symbol, right? Take it out or you don't come. So there was a big brouhaha, you probably don't remember, in 2007, 2008, right? And eventually, of course, because the United States can say, if Taiwan is not going, we're not going. So Beijing sort of backed down. All right, all right, same flag, right? What I'm trying to say here, there's a strong point to be made that the Chinese start to realize this is not even acceptable now, politically speaking. In 82, it's fine, but today it's different, right? Because today, we want to reduce the uh, significance of Taiwanese identity and treat Taiwan more like part of China. So therefore, this flag is now less popular, I mean, less acceptable to the Chinese than, say, 40, 30 some years ago, right? So in other words, things are evolving, right? That's one point I want to make here. All right, so how do we see Taiwan? I'm going to present to you two views, right? The alternative, identical, and contrasting narratives about Taiwan uh, from Chinese point of view, meaning PRC and ROC before 1990s. And Taiwanese view means I would say after 1990s. So there's two set of uh, views about history. The first set is that Taiwan is always a part of China. No question asked since ancient time. The other one is Taiwan's island discovered only until 16th century by the Europeans, 
That's a different alternative idea, right? So the Chinese claim they first discovered Taiwan, recorded in their history books as early as the second century uh, uh, CE, right? That's like uh, 1800 years ago. But the, the alternative Taiwanese narrative is, it's called Formosa. Formosa Insula was discovered by the Portuguese. They actually give the Portuguese name, beautiful island, right? And then, of course, uh, Chinese will argue, argue <coughs> that during the Yuan and the Ming dynasties in the 13th century, they actually established a governance structure over there. Not on mainland Taiwan, but on Penghu. It's called Penghu Xuan Jian Si, right? That's the Chinese uh, version. The Taiwanese version is, it was never recorded in anything until 1582 by the Portuguese, different view, right? And then, of course, they agree on the foreign occupation part by the Dutch, by the Spanish, and by the Chinese recovery of that, right? The Zheng Chen Gong recovery of Taiwan versus the Kingdom of Tongning. That's Zheng Chen Gong's official uh, title, right? And then there's an agreement on Qing's rule, the Manchu dynasty's unification of Taiwan. And then, of course, the uh, resisting Japanese, the uh, Republic of Formosa idea, very briefly, a few months. And then, of course, Japanese rule, Japanese colonization of Taiwan. And then, of course, the ROC recovery of Taiwan, 1945 to 1949, very briefly. And then, of course, the unfinished civil war, Chinese view, versus the Republic of Taiwan, independent until today. So two different views, right? Oops. Oh, OK, here we go. And in terms of people and personality, I'm just moving it quickly here. In other words, fundamentally now we have two competing different narratives on, main, on the island of Taiwan versus on mainland China, right? These two competing narratives are causing a lot of conflicts, lots of trouble uh, for both sides and for the international community, right? Right now, internationally speaking, ROC on Taiwan or Taiwan itself is not considered a state, a country. It's considered part of China. but. Taiwan enjoys de facto recognition from many countries, including the United States, right? We have a de facto relationship with Taiwan, right? Uh, Chinese, I mean, American representatives in Taiwan are treated like diplomats and vice versa, right? even though we don't recognize it as a country. For, for China, this is just two governments of a civil war that yet to be finished. Uh, Taiwan needs to be recovered and to be bring back to the motherland. So two competing views here, right? All right, so here are some images of Taiwan. Very briefly, I want to uh, submit for you to consider a, a f several points. Between PRC and ROC, basically, you are talking about a political opposition in general Chinese politics, right? ROC and its existence on Taiwan so far for the past five to seven centuries, in my view, has been a catalyst for the political transformation and the political changes on mainland China, right? And vice versa. Without PRC, ROC probably would not really make its own uh, political transformation either. So it's kind of like a opposition. And then between the concept of Taiwan and, and China, you have a different uh, narrative, different debate versus one country, de facto independence, but one country or something different, right? Many would suggest it's only a matter of time for Taiwan to be united with China. That many would suggest it because PRC power is growing. International community does not recognize Taiwan as an independent country. So therefore, it's only a matter of time. Taiwan will come back, right? And we'll see whether that's the case or not. But before I leave the topic of Taiwan, I want to show you this. This was the Chinese attitude to Taiwan. That's called, we will liberate Taiwan with, with this, of course. We're going to liberate Taiwan. But things have changed. Right now, the Chinese attitude is this. It's like. We're going to unite with Taiwan peacefully. And President Xi Jinping pledged on the front page of People's Daily, saying, we will do good things for Taiwanese uh, compatriots, just like we did good things for compatriots on mainland China. Right? This kind of statement can be interpreted in different ways. Right? Many of my friends on Taiwan will say, thank God, please not. Right? That's kind of reaction. But people on mainland China say, we're going to treat you as the same as our own people. So different views, different take. Right? All right. How do Taiwanese people view those things? Well, here is a little diagram of the opinion survey done by what I think is the best opinion survey organization in Taiwan, Zheng Da, Zheng Zhi Da Xue, NCCU. They did a kind of a tracking. So from 1992 all the way to 18, 2018, you see the opinion changes quite, quite a bit uh, on, the mainland, on the island China. 
The green line represents people claim they're only Taiwanese, not Chinese, right? The purple line uh, uh, record people say, I'm Taiwanese, but I'm also Chinese, right? And the blue line uh, record people say, who, who believe uh, they are Chinese only, not Taiwanese, right? The black line records people who don't know who they are. They think, oh, we're aliens, <laughs> right? That kind of thing. As you can see, a time goes, many more Taiwanese now believe they are Taiwanese only, not Chinese, right? People who believe they are Chinese only now actually are smaller than the marginal error. That's where the worrisome sign is from Beijing's point of view. In other words, they think over time Taiwan is drifting away. It's drifting away because Taiwanese people don't claim this sort of Chinese anymore, majority, right? That's kind of worrisome. This is another map. It's even more worrisome. This one is, is done by a uh, uh, relatively green color, independence uh, leaning uh, kind of organization, which claims that more Taiwanese now want independence right away. Very few want unification. Uh, that's kind of uh, uh, the uh, Taiwanese attitude. Those opinions may or may not matter much, matter much in international relations, as you all know. International relations, muscles talk, right? So it may not matter much, but it indicates that Taiwan is indeed kind of drifting aside, drifting away, right? That's kind of something to be concerned. All right, I'm kind of running fast here. Ta Hong Kong. Here's a timeline for what happens in Hong Kong. What is the Hong Kong issue, right? The first thing, of course, is the Qing Empire uh, gave Hong Kong to the British, uh, part of it, in 1842, at the end of the Sino-Anglo War, Anglo-Sino War, what we call the Opium War, first Opium War, right? And then in 1860, they also gave Kowloon to British, so two little areas. And then in 18 uh, 98, they sort of uh, leased, this time it's not give, but leased new territory to the British. Altogether, that's the British colony of Hong Kong. And then, of course, the follow the following that, you know what happened is, is that uh, British eventually negotiated with Beijing to return the whole thing to China uh, on the condition the place will be kept unchanged for 50 years of its own legal, political systems, economic systems. It's called high degree of autonomy. In other words, Hong Kong court will have the final say on any case cases. Beijing will not intervene in local matters. And uh, Hong Kong will not argue with Beijing about who belongs to whom, right? Of course, Hong Kong belongs to China, part of China, right? What happened after 1997 was high hopes, but the high hopes were quickly dashed, unfortunately. Right. And of course, it peaked in 2014 with the so-called umbrella movement. And of course, now it can intensify in the kind of uh, anti-extradition bill, Fan Song Zong movement, and it's currently going on. As we speak, yesterday, there even more violence going on over there, demonstrations and uh, accusations and so on. So Hong Kong now is in, it's boiling, basically, right? It's kind of unfortunate because Hong Kong, in many ways, in my humble opinion, Hong Kong probably is the most open, the most liberal, the most advanced part of greater China. But that part now is in trouble. That's really discouraging, depressing, if you will, right? Uh, in other words, we see trouble in the best developed region of China, not in the least developed places in China. For example, Xinjiang, Tibet would be more expected, but here is in Taiwan. That's quite depressing and also very significant, right? So here's the kind of map of Hong Kong. This is new territory. This is Kowloon, and this is Hong Kong itself. This one is more clear. So the British literally gave these two pieces of property to the, to the British, I mean, uh, the Qing Dynasty, Chinese government at the time, gave these two territories, Kowloon and Hong Kong, to the British. And then British leased all this territory from them, from uh, Chinese, for 99 years. So the lease was due in 97. The British, in order to preserve the welfare and its investment in the whole region, wanted to lease the whole thing again. The Chinese denied that under Deng Xiaoping's leadership. They said, no, no way. And the British said, well, how about if we uh, return only the lease part to you, but keep these two islands? But the British themselves uh, uh, sort of uh, shoot that uh, proposition down because we all know these two pieces of territory would not be able to survive well without new territory. Because legally, the British could have argued that way. 
could legally these two were British territory, and the green part was leased territory, Chinese territory. I'm, I'm, I'm renting from you, basically, right? So the British said, okay, I'm gonna return everything to you on condition, 50 years, no change. The Chinese very uh, ingenious uh, proposal is called one country, two systems. So they allow Hong Kong, the whole area, be part of China on condition on a different system, right? It's called one country, two systems. That is now being questioned quite seriously by many in Hong Kong. That, in my opinion, is a root cause of troubles over there, right? Because one country system, the, the kind of a, a blueprint offered by Deng Xiaoping back in the 1980s now seems to be shaky, right? As people said, no, no, no more. We, we want real one country two systems, not this kind of losing one country systems. That's, in my opinion, it's a root level. Unfortunately, the opposition in, Thai, in Hong Kong is poorly organized. So there has been quite a bit disorganized, even violent activities going on, which is unfortunate because um, Taiwan and mainland are such important partners together, right? Um, as you see, Taiwan and Hong Kong are mutual, I mean, mainland and Hong Kong are mutually dependent on each other quite a bit. It's easy to understand Hong Kong depends on mainland for food, water, manpower, and all kinds of stuff, right? But it's harder probably to understand that mainland also needs Hong Kong in an important way. For example, the critical access to foreign market capital and technology often takes place through Hong Kong, right? From 1970s until today, foreign capital goes to China quite a bit. 65 to 90% of them, depending on which year, all through Hong Kong. Even this year, from January to July, still 73.8% of foreign capital goes to China all through Hong Kong. So can you imagine for China to lose Hong Kong? Hardly, hardly, right? Finally, the point about the relationship between Hong Kong and mainland is that United States and Western countries have granted Hong Kong a special status, right? Given Hong Kong special rights. And that now increasingly is going to be pending on what Beijing is doing to Hong Kong. Because I'm serious. As we speak today, the US Congress will vote on a new law saying we're going to have an annual review of what's going on over there. Instead of uh, sticking to the old US law that was, passed, that was passed in 1992, many years ago, to grant Hong Kong special status. This actually, in my opinion, is a big alarm bell, right? Because if the United States took away the special treatment to Hong Kong, Hong Kong will be considered part of the PRC completely. That will be detrimental to the Hong Kong economy. And in turn, will be very bad for the PRC economy as well. They're gonna lose all this access to foreign capital and foreign technology. That's gonna be a big deal. The implication of that is very hard to imagine, right? All right. So what is going on here is clearly we now see there are political problems between Hong Kong and mainland, and there are social uh, political differences between the two parts, right? Um, Hong Kong now become quite emotional issue. Uh, I want to point out though, the Hong Kong demonstrators so far, to be fair, only very few of them really want independence. So to label the whole thing as uh, wanting independence was misleading. So I'm worried that people uh, on the mainland China may be actually misleading themselves by claiming, oh, those guys are demonstrating for independence. It's completely wrong. Very, very, very few Hong Kong people want independence. Most of them want what? Want kind of uh, Beijing to retreat a little bit. Let them keep their one country, two systems. That's the argument, right? That argument, of, unfortunately, lost. So therefore, you have ugly kind of uh, things going on uh, currently. I do have a little short video. Maybe I don't have time to show it, but I'm going to skip that. Uh, this basically short video is, is show you how the emotionally charged uh, accusations on both sides now are hurting everybody, right? Now people start accusing each other with even profanities because they think, you don't understand me, you don't understand me. You want something I cannot give you, and I want something you don't give me. That's kind of argument, right? Just imagine if you had a quarrel with a significant other for something that highly emotionally charged. It's similar to that. Very, very bad development. As a result, many Hong Kongers, Hong Kong people, now are developing a kind of uh, unfriendly attitude to the men in China, and vice versa. Because in men in China, we don't have a really massive, reliable opinion survey, so I cannot tell. But uh, official media on China, uh, on men in China, is increasingly uh, uh, kind of uh, having animosity towards Hong Kong now. 
on Hong Kong National Opinion Survey and indicating more and more Hong Kong people are unhappy with the kind of a one country two system under Beijing's control, right? And according to economists, now almost nobody in Hong Kong under 30 identifies as Chinese. That's a bad sign because the future is always young people's future, right? And if uh, young people think they are not Chinese anymore, that's a bad sign. Consider Hong Kong is legally part of China already. There's no, there's no issue about independence, actually. Very, very few people really talk about that. But you don't concern yourself with Chinese. It's like most people, uh, young people in Alabama concern themselves not Americans anymore. And that's dangerous, right? Then you're talking about maybe Republic of Alabama or something, you know, that's very scary. Uh, chances are very slim, but that's, that's what happened. And this is like uh, the opinion service, as you can see. You know, very few people them to be a Chinese anymore. Look at this, 18 to 29 age group, you consider yourself a Chinese, it's almost none. That's significant, right, as you can imagine. Uh, that's uh, where the problem is. All right, this is a beautiful Hong Kong. Hong Kong is really, truly, truly beautiful, mesmerizing Asian city, right? Wonderful place. Look at this, right? Uh, I like this boat quite a bit. You can, you can rent it I mean, for party, it'll be fun. It's great, right? It's wonderful. But now, unfortunately, ugly picture like this is uh, capturing people's attention around the world. It's already delivering economic blows against Hong Kong already, big time. Right? Hong Kong economy is in a negative territory right now. Right? And lots of tycoons are moving money out of Hong Kong. And many new investment projects have been canceled in Hong Kong because they don't want to do anything. That's significant, because Hong Kong has only seven, six, seven million people highly dependent on foreign capital, foreign contracts, and so on, and tourists. Right? This is bad. Right? And look at this. Hong Kong people are considered traditionally to be highly pragmatic, commercial people, for them to mass in numbers, to match in numbers on the street is very unusual, right? I have not been uh, in Hong Kong for over a year, so I don't know what really people think, but I can, sen I can sense they must feel very strongly, a very tense feeling, right? And of course, uh, another video here, but uh, I'll forget about it. Um, but this kind of picture is very ugly, and this become an iconic picture, right? For Hong Kong police to pull a service ri rival, uh, revolver against a demonstrator like that. It reminds people of classic views from Vietnamese war era and so on. It's a kind of scary picture, right? This, unfortunately, does not represent Hong Kong, but now is capturing attention from all over the world. And that's where the problem is, right? All right, this is something I'm going to show you why this special treatment Hong Kong receives from the United States is important. Look at this. This is how many countries will take your passport without a visa to let you visit their country, right? U.S. passport, as you can imagine, is kind of well received. You know, people cursing the United States quite a bit, but still they take a uh, U.S. passport quite nicely. So we have 174 countries give us visa-free treatment. If you have a U.S. passport, go to this country, easy. And look at Hong Kong, quite nice, 156. Remind you, Hong Kong passport actually has a People's Republic of China on it with Hong Kong in parentheses, right, on it. Highly treatment. This, thanks to special treatment. Without that, you're going to have a PRC passport. Know what happens? You get 45 or even six countries give you visa-free treatment. What I'm trying to say here is it's very tangible for the Hong Kong people to keep the special treatment in place. But that now is up in air because uh, the U.S. government is thinking that Hong Kong and PRC are now become inseparable increasingly. Then why treat one part of it specially, right? That's a big deal. If you are Hong Kong people, you're worried about this, right? You should be. And if you are Chinese, or mainland China, you should be also worried because this is a great kind of conveyor belt of foreign capital and technology. If you can cut it off, it's a terrible loss, right? So I guess very few Hong Kong people, or even Chinese, want to have this treatment. They want this treatment, it's better, right? So that's kind of a, what is uh, at stake. Finally, US and China. Uh, do I have a few minutes, maybe? Okay, all right, US and China. I view, I view this relationship as the single most important bilateral relationship in the world. Of course, I'm biased, right? Uh, what about the first state, Canada? It's important, right? Uh, but any Canadians here? All right, just view the first state, right? That's very important. But I, I'm, I'm biased to suggest this relationship is very important, right? And I also submit for you guys to think this relationship has been mutually beneficial for over 100 years, right? There's a highly complementary economic interaction between the two countries, right? What we produce here usually are the things they don't produce over there, and vice versa. 
So it's highly complementary, right? Very intense exchange. I would also submit for this thing, there's no fundamental conflicts between two peoples, American and Chinese, no fundamental differences. Well, the problem is common problems, like uh, trade disputes, you know, using chopstickers with a fork, you know, go Chinese restaurant or go to Pizza Hut, you know, kind of differences, right? And that's all right, They're all manageable, right? Um, economic friction, cultural differences, no, all manageable. But, uh, uh, but there's also great potential for the two to work together to better the world, improve the world, clearly so, right? But that's also not to be blind to the fact that there are some mismatches and incompatibility between the two countries, right? They're significant, actually. Uh, basically, on one level, you could argue this is so-called East versus West, the two ancient civilizations. It's very, very common for our Chinese friend to think, America, oh, young little boy, little kid, only 200 years old. We, 5,000 years old. We are an old man. You guys are young kiddo. They forgot. America is an inheritor of a very long Western civilization. Right? The very fact we call our Congress Capitol Hill, we call Senator, Senator, that's deliberate inheritance of the Romans. Right? You all know the term come from there. Right? So to call America as a young boy would be missing the point. It is a young place, but ancient civilization. Right. So at one level, you do see two ancient civilizations competing, matching, mismatching in some ways. Second, I mean, and more specifically, we're talking about what I consider the Qinghan polity, that is the Chinese authoritarianism versus Western democracy. So political is different too, right? And then you have uh, the different world views, the Tianxia world unification idea versus with thought international relations. If you guys don't know what the jargon means, means basically the Chinese would love to have the whole world united under one because geography was so and so on, right? So therefore, we Chinese value Tianxia Yitong, a whole world united under one. Whereas Americans actually thrived, or Europeans thrived on the divided international politics since Westphalia, since the 17th century. That is, we're all countries. Canadians may be favored first, but they entitled to do their stupid things, right? They, they, they are themselves, right? That's the idea. Uh, that's quite different from the Chinese concept, right? So the China order versus Western American order, that's kind of a mismatch or incompatibility, if you will, right? For the first 30 years of PRC history, indeed, United States and China was in confrontation, right? We had a hot war, we had a cold war. Right. We fought in Korea quite a bit. Uh, about 47,000 Americans lost lives in Korea fighting the Chinese. How many Chinese died? A quiz. You guys want to answer? I don't blame you, because I don't know either. <laughs> it's, a, it's a classified information. But it's anywhere between 200,000 to a million Chinese lost lives. A lot of Chinese died in, 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 in the process. It's a very brutal fight, right? And then Cold War. But the past 40 years is, is generally categorized as engagement, right? PRC and USA were working together uh, quite closely, right? Uh, the rivalry between two countries become manageable uh, because PRC was kind of considered weak, got distracted, and we got distracted too, right? United States got distracted too, so it's manageable. Uh, and PRC switched side. And also for the United States now developed a very kind of a idealistic view to change China somewhat, right? To make China a fellow stakeholder in the system. It's called engagement policy, to make them a responsible stakeholder. Yours truly actually contributed to the idea of incorporating China. Uh, this tells you how old I am. 20 years ago, I published an article in the Washington Quarterly, which is run by CSIS in Washington, DC, it's a major think tank, I argued to incorporate China is a new policy for new era. So I was contributing a little bit to the, to the idea to incorporate China, to change China, right? Uh, I made an argument 20 years ago, right? The engagement policy pays off beautifully in many ways, right? I still believe that's a good policy for the time being. The great impact of that is unbelievable. Chinese economy exploded, bloomed. Chinese society changed in many ways as well. Look at the skyline of uh, Shanghai, Pudong. Right? 30 years ago, nothing was there. I literally witnessed the growth of Pudong, the skyline, very beautiful, right? Look at Beijing, beautiful. Nothing like this was there 30 years ago, right? That's the testimony of uh, Chinese economic growth. This is skyline of Atlanta, right? Also impressive, 30 years, uh, yeah, 40 years ago, when Deng Xiaoping visited the United States, he stayed in this hotel, 
Peachtree Plaza uh, Hotel, a Western Hotel. And he looked out. The skyline of Atlanta at the time is roughly the same, unfortunately, as today. We didn't change much. You know, we're kind of a little lazy at Georgia Tech. You know, we didn't work uh, too much. So the skyline is the same. Deng Xiaoping allegedly was so impressed by this, he said two sentences recorded down as big uh, instructions. First sentence, capitalism doesn't look too bad. That's great. Your capitalism doesn't look too bad. Secondly, people who are good with America seem to all make money, become rich. That's it. That really laid down the foundation for opening and reform. And we, many Chinese students here and I myself, were beneficiary of that policy, opening and reform. Look at this skyline today. Look at this. No comparison. 40 years ago, quite impressive. Today, not, com not impressive at all. Right? Chinese have caught up uh, in this particular uh, area. And of course, Western culture and uh, universal values, if you will, also permeated in China quite a bit. Look at this, Starbucks inside Forbidden City, right? Oh, actually, next to Forbidden City. I took the picture at night. Pretty good quality, right? Um, and this is a picture I took on a high-speed railroad uh, train in China, uh, with permission, by the way, with permission. And look at these college students, what they wear on this, right? I asked them, do you know the meaning of these words? They said, oh, we don't know. This is from America. It's kind of cool. <laughs> it's kind of cool, right? Whatever, a kiss, whatever, is cool, right? Uh, it's, kind of, it's, it's a sign, right? And this is another one. As soon as the US Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage, the Chinese had their same-sex marriage weddings. Still illegal in China, but they had considered to be OK now. The Chinese government actually looked the other way. They didn't really punish them, right? So this kind of changes going on. And this is how the Chinese celebrate Christmas from time to time. I don't know what you guys celebrate Christmas here like that. I'm, not, I'm sure in Georgia I wouldn't do that, right? No, no, that's different. There's no snow either, <laughs> except it could do North Carolina, maybe, right? Um, and also, you also have a diverse opinion of saying, we boycott Christmas, right? For me, those are signs of diversity of China and the colorfulness of China, which essentially was intended by engagement in policy. That is, to let the Chinese think them themselves, to develop their own views, and compete, compare, and, and grow together. That's the idea, right? Those are the success side of engagement policy. If you want to know what I'm thinking today, this is my new book, uh, uh, Morris mentioned. I'm a commercial a little bit, but the Chinese version is free, basically. I actually donated uh, uh, royalties to all the publishers, because you don't make money by publishing academic books, right? So the new book obviously have a slightly different take uh, than the stuff I wrote uh, 20 years ago, right? And again, if you want to find out more, uh, go online and check it out. I mean, it's, uh, Chinese version is, uh, is free anyway. English version is kind of cheap. The paperback, you know, kind of cheap. And all the proceeds go to publisher, uh, university press anyway, right? All right, but what is more serious is that engagement of policy for the past 40 years, of, uh, for the past 40 years, or oh, time's up, I guess, right? Mm. Uh, should I keep here? No or yes? Uh. Back. Oh, it's not on that. Anyway, but more seriously, for the 40, past 40 years, engagement policy has paid off beautifully in many, many ways uh, for the Chinese, for the world. Because if you go to Walmart, buy things made in China, just so cheap, right? Abundant, it's great, right? Uh, and at Apple, my favorite uh, high-tech company, favorite because I own quite a few of them, um, they made a kill in China as well. They made a lot of money from China, so it's a good thing. But seriously, engagement policy seems to have failed in its main mission so far. The Chinese political system refused to change. Not only refuse change, it become even more powerful today, more resourceful. So therefore, that's the concern. That's a new concern in the United States and outside China, right? Now, they did not change. They did not become the responsible stakeholder or good buddies, and they actually get more money now, They're richer than before. That's where the new concern start to uh, come in, right? So in other words, the question in Washington outside is, how long can you engage without a marriage or split? Ask yourself, how long can you engage with a guy or a girl for 40 years without a marriage and without a split? What is that? That become a question, right? Ask yourself. I don't know the answer to that. And also, the PRC clearly is vastly enriched, empowered, and emboldened. That's another concern, right? In a minute, I'm going to show you uh, the kind of uh, uh, new take of what's happening here, right? Seems to be that China is playing on the equal footing. Or more now with the United States. 
That also is scary to many Americans, uh, to many American leaders to be exact, right? And then the Chinese may be presenting a new world order uh, in its own image, as idea, right? Uh, supposedly, Mr. You know who is handing over the world to Mr. You know who, right? Uh, that's where the concern is, right? The new world order may or may not be that great for the United States. So that's the concern uh, currently is uh, creeping up. Uh, in some corners, already exploded, right? It become actually the foundation for the very, very rare bipartisan consensus in Washington. President Obama, for whatever he does, he enjoys very little bipartisan support, except tough on China. And that's new bipartisan support, right? All right. For the Chinese, however, they also are clearly telling the world they are moving out, right? They are not happy with being sealed in by the so-called first island chain or second island chain. They are willing to go out to reach the third island chain. By the way, this is Hawaii, right? So they have been talking about, let's sort of divide Pacific. You to the, this part, I to this part, right? That, of course, is fine with Americans, because we don't care. You know, we don't really need to go to the dip. We go to Caribbeans for fun, right? We don't go there. But what about the US allies, like Japan, South Korea, and so on? They're kind of nervous, right? And the United States has to think about this now. And also the Chinese great plan of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, uh, One Road, One Belt Initiative, the Chinese have pledged $1.4 trillion for that. That's a lot of money. Over 10 times as large as the Marshall Plan in today's dollars. Very huge, right? So you could say the Chinese are pushing out forcefully, right? With a lot of spending, right? Uh, of course, military speaking also is a concern. The Chinese Navy is making ships like they're making dumplings. The Chinese official news press, Xinhua News Agency, literally said, we are launching new Navy warships like making dumplings, like one after one, you know, keep it going. So for the first time in history, by 2025, not long from now, the Chinese Navy will have a larger tonnage than U.S. Navy, meaning have more ships than U.S. Navy. Quality, don't know, but at least quantity will be overpassing. Mind you, this never happened in over 150 years before, right? Two countries in the past tried to do the same. They all failed. One is Imperial Japan, one was Soviet Union. They all failed, right? But Chinese may actually get there because they're spending more on shipbuilding now than almost the rest of the world combined in manufacturing new warships on the sea. A serious investment. So all that led to the problem, the so-called trade war. The U.S.-China trade is highly lucrative for China. Here are some numbers. In other words, the Chinese foreign trade surplus mostly come from, China, from the United States. How much is anywhere from 80% to 130% every year all come from the United States. In other words, without U.S. trade, China would have been running deficit most of the years. Uh, very serious. The trillions Chinese have in foreign country reserve and building ships, uh, BRI, all come from the United States. And that's where the U.S. trade war with China bites, very significant, right? Uh, so significant that a, US, a Chinese trade, uh, a Chinese export to the United States and Chinese foreign currency reserve are both shrinking as a result, even a few years, a few months of trade war between U.S. and China. President Trump picked up a kind of a clumsy weapon, tariffs. But that thing seems to be working, strangely enough, right? Uh, finally, let me, let me stop here and uh, by suggesting there is a storm gathering over the Pacific. What's the nature of that? It's up to us to think about it. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, oh. so much for the uh, sure. <coughs> wonderful uh, and, and extremely uh, informative uh, presentation. Thank you. And, and I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, Dr. Wang's presentation uh, as much as, <coughs> as I did. Now, I'd like, I'd like to, uh, uh, like to uh, now open the floor uh, <coughs> for the questions. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for the talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and if that is more related to fossil fuel and 
interests and resource interests, or is it a territorial uh, you know, interest? Okay, great question. The Chinese uh, action in South China Sea. Um, you mentioned two possible reasons for resource, you know, oil and gas, and also for uh, territorial gains. Uh, I would add maybe there's another concern is to have a geopolitical play in the region to, uh, from a U.S. point of view, to squeeze the U.S. Navy out, right, to have control over the region. Uh, that is reflected by the militarization of those artificial islands China made. They made six artificial islands, very big ones, right, out of uh, submerged reefs, right. And now they have militarized them, meaning put missiles on them, fighter plans, or guns, and so on on them. Uh, President Trump, I heard, actually took it personally when President Xi Jinping said, oh, we're not going to militarize that. But six months later, they militarized them. Right? So President Trump took it personally. He said, oh, how could you do that? So you kind of take the offense. Um, so that's uh, three reasons I can think of for the Chinese push to the South China Sea. It's very uh, expensive. You, know, you can make an island in the ocean. It's very expensive. And maintain it. And running the uh, supply uh, uh, of uh, those islands is very expensive. But obviously, they have made a decision to do that. Uh, that, of course, is taken by many as a sign of Chinese push out, you know, sort of go out, to influencing the region. Right, uh, right now, the uh, countries in the region, Philippines, Indonesians, Vietnamese, uh, are too weak to, uh, to resist. United States is the only bad boy in the block, you know, sort of doing things there. But the Chinese are interested in keeping uh, U.S. Navy out, out of the West Pacific. That clearly uh, is one of the reasons, yeah. Yes, sir. Your presentation, by the way. Thank like you. Thank you. Uh, I, got, I guess I got two quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, one is just on you know, free speech in China. Free speech in China. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you know, there's lots of censorship there. Right. I wonder how that's all going to play on in the future. Okay. And my second question is, how do you you know see the unrest in Hong Kong coming to an end? Okay. First question first. Uh, the uh, freedom of speech issue in China is a uh, pre-annual issue. The PRC government uh, fluctuates sometimes. Sometimes they have more tolerance. Some have less tolerance of freedom of speech. Right now, it seems to be less tolerance. Uh, the control of Chinese uh, uh, media and even cyberspace is getting tight uh, right now. But you still see there are some uh, rooms uh, for people to talk their minds, uh, arguably mostly anonymously and most short-lived. Uh, in the cyberspace. For example, on WeChat, WeXing, right? you have all kinds of views, but then you get it deleted quickly. Uh, Sensors are pretty efficient. And thanks to American firms, because Cisco and all these firms provided the best software, best hardware for the do that business. The Chinese internet control, website control, is the best in the world. No second, even coming even close. Very efficient. But even that, people still are using social media to swap things, to talk about things, and have satires and so on, right? So you have this kind of uh, tug of war, tug of war. You have this kind of mouse and cat, cat game, right? And Chinese also use VPNs to access outside uh, websites. Those things are kind of expensive, unreliable, uh, slow, but you know, you have a way to there. So it's kind of a fighting. Uh, so freedom of, uh, of speech in China is not entirely extinguished, but it's always under tight control. That's where the problem is for many, because if you cannot let your own people speak freely, how can you convince the rest of the world I'm a better leader than the previous bully, right, meaning the United States? The United States can be a bully you know, from time to time, right? We do a lot of bad things. But how can you convince the world that I'm better than you? But still, yet, I don't want my people to speak. That's a, a kind of qu issue here. Uh, talking about Hong Kong, I actually don't know. Because uh, Hong Kong, uh, very few people uh, expected Hong Kong to be evolved into such three months ago, four months ago when it started, right? Now it's getting pretty serious. Both sides now seem to have a, a big gulf between them, an enlarging gulf, right? It's very hard to imagine now a peaceful, amicable, kind of a, a nice ending uh, right now. I mean, uh, people are preparing for, bracing for some violent ending. So we don't know. I hope that never happened. But if that happens, I bet you Hong Kong's special status will be gone immediately. Right. So therefore, it's very consequential. Beijing so far has exhibited a quite high degree of patience or tolerance. Right. Okay, no PLA, no military intervention, but the rhetoric coming from Beijing is very nerve-wracking because they're talking about, oh, people want Hong Kong independence, which is not true. 
right? They're talking about, oh, those are terrorists, which is also not quite true, right? And they're also talking about those guys are um, uh, controlled, managed, funded by CIA, which is completely untrue, right, based on what I know. So those rhetoric is scary, because those rhetoric usually are the prelude, prelude for using force. So we'll see. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm kind of uh, worried, because as anybody should, because uh, at least millions of people there are, uh, their life stake, their livelihood is on, online. And also the future of China is gonna be affected as well. Right? So it is kind of a great, some, uh, uh, serious uh, situation. But I don't really know clearly what's gonna happen. Uh, but I'm worried for the, for the worst, yeah. Sure, yeah, sorry. Um, for the US and China to work together going forward, right. how do you think they're going to overcome barriers like differing views on intellectual property? Uh -huh. That's a difficult question, but a very important one. Uh, currently, as you know, uh, United States and China is engaging in yet more trade talks, right? As I mentioned, President Trump picked up a, a trade war weapon, tariffs, which is, according to economists, is a very crude weapon. It's not a very good weapon, right? You kill maybe 100 enemy, you injure 50 of yourselves. This is not a very good weapon, but for whatever reason, this doesn't seem to be working because it is leading to the reduction of Chinese export to the United States, meaning less money made in the United States, meaning the uh, decline of Chinese uh, employment and also Chinese foreign currency reserve, two key things to the legitimacy of Chinese government. So therefore it hurts. So the Chinese are negotiating. And one of the big point of negotiation is how to better protect American intellectual properties, right? Uh, as, as far as I know, just recently, I mean, just this week, they seem to achieve some kind of agreement. China will uh, beef up protection of American intellectual properties. But we'll see what, what is going on, what's the details, because that kind of talk has been in place for two decades, right? So far, we'll see what's the details. I'm all hope, hoping that Chinese will have a better uh, protection of intellectual property rights, not for Americans, but for themselves, because without good uh, protection of intellectual property rights, the Chinese innovation, Chinese creativity are fundamentally uh, wounded as well, right? Because Chinese property rights also violated too, same time. So it's in China's interest to better protect intellectual properties, right? But how uh, is different. And also it's a short-term interest versus long-term interest. Long-term interest is protect intellectual property rights better for Americans and for Chinese. But short-term interest is, I'll get your cool technology, and we build something and beat you, right? That's short-term interest. So it's uh, pretty difficult. Uh, uh, my hunch is it's extremely hard for China to have a fundamental overhaul of intellectual property rights protection uh, yet, because they still see a lot of short-term interest to be ripped through this and that, right? So I'm not too optimistic in that regard, but I'm generally optimistic that in the long run, the Chinese will realize it's actually in their interest to have a better intellectual property rights, right? It's just, by that time, uh, they probably think America is already being reduced to a small power, then they can afford to do that. That may be the case, right? A timing issue here. Other questions? Yes. How do you think the um, social credit score that mm. China's been implementing on a lot of these people mm. affects the, the ability for freedom of speech? Right. Many of the people are going to be able to express themselves in China. Great question. Uh, another impressive question. You guys obviously are following uh, things quite closely. It's wonderful. The social credit system he was talking about is the Chinese government with the help of IT companies to construct a system to rank everybody. It's like a credit report you, we have here in the United States, except this one includes non-economic stuff, like your behavior, your, you know, uh, your relationship with police, and uh, you consider to be a good guy, bad guy, things like that. It's uh, complicated. And using that to rate you, everybody, right? That system is in its infancy right now. It's been tested. Pilot testing uh, programs been done in China uh, in a small scale. But for many, it indicates the PRC government is willing and also increasingly able to use the modern IT to control everybody, right? Let me give you an anecdote, which is kind of related but not quite related. Uh, it's actually it's a video on t uh, YouTube now. It's openly posted on YouTube by a bunch of Europeans and American young people like you guys, IT people. They went to China to have a good time. Uh, from Hong Kong to Shenzhen, have a good time, and they purchase a local phone card, your know, mobile phone card, right? Because in China, by a local phone card, you need to show ID. So they show your passport, everything, they buy a local phone card. A couple of hours later, they kind of jaywalked on Shenzhen Street. I mean, jaywalking is no big deal in the South, right? We do that all the time. 
I mean, in those two. I mean, we do the jaywalking, what big deal? Except those guys, when they reach the other side of the street, a few minutes later, they receive a text message on their phone, say, you have just been fined 50 quai for jaywalking. Those guys are really, what? You guys watch so closely? That's where the worry is. In other words, new technology has allowed the state to do things almost unthinkable in the past. That's where the worry is. I guess social credit itself may not be a bad idea. You know, you, you reward good behavior, you punish bad behavior, but it is it's use or abuse that concerns people, right? Fortunately, it's not a national system just yet. It's just been tested right now. But that's a worrisome sign, indeed. It will have a fundamental uh, negative effect, I think, on people's freedom of speech and their freedom. Because next time you jaywalk, a few minutes later, you receive a bill for fines. It's like, what? People are watching. How do they do that? Because there are facial recognition cameras everywhere, and they can match you to your ID and then send you a message, say, hey, you're just fine. No big deal, 50 quai, which is equivalent of $6. But still, kind of a nerve wracking, right? Next time you better, better behave. That's the idea, right? So, you know, uh, drinking root beer only, no real beer. Uh, that'd be uh, safe, right? Uh, do I get uh, some uh, Chinese students here to ask some questions? Uh, I'd love to talk to uh, people from China. Questions? OK, yeah. Mm -hmm. and how, can, uh, how can you know if it's like my bias, like interpretations or inceptions? Like, mm -hmm. I feel like, is that a war? Do you think the, 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 there's a trend that the war is tend to like break, break apart a little bit? I mean, the world. Like 20 years ago, you know, like between the China and Taiwan, we have like one country, two interpretations. Mm -hmm. like, right. Kind of things. Right. And like, for example, 10 years ago, I was like in Hong Kong, you know, studying. Mm -hmm. I feel at the time, you know, the, the society is much peacefully, you know, mm -hmm. like compared mm -hmm. to now the chaotic protest. Mm -hmm. And also, like the United States and you know the U.S. and China relations, like mm -hmm. for example, ten years, twenty years ago, you know, when, when China tried to mm -hmm. apply for the Olympic Games in two thousand, first two thousand, and then two thousand eight, right. you know, and or WTO, you know, at the time, like the like the war, there's a trend of the globalization, which right. we feel. Like nowadays, it seems like there might be like a trend. Like, is is there really a trend or? Um, or it's just my, you know, since I grew up in the specific time, I mean, that might be like my bias or, or like stereotype. And also, I grew up in a particular, you know, since I live in mainland China, I live in Hong Kong, I moved to the U.S. for like seven years. So, I mean, is that the feeling because of this or is there really a trend? And do you think this trend will be, you know, um, like, for example, since the technology, I mean, the science and technology, the globalization will be like a trend. Since the plane will go faster and faster, mm -hmm. technology will advance always. Mm -hmm. So, uh, will there be like a trend, for example, in the future, like the people uh, or the or people or the countries tend to act alone, or they will, you know, try to like embrace again? Mm -hmm. and so, what do you think in, in the future? Like? Great question and a wonderful observation. I commend you for uh, making this kind of. Uh, almost a philosophical thinking. Uh, I thought this kind of philo philosophical thinking are old people's uh, kind of uh, specialties. For young people to do that is wonderful. Um, well, I, I, I think you're right. And there are a few uh, signs to suggest the world is going to hell. I mean, we sort of have all kinds of problems. Right? Um, look at the United States, our political system. What is happening inside Bellway? Oh, man. You know, Things are happening, it looks like that. Um, and also, worldwide, you'd also see a lot of divisive forces pushing people apart and uh, causing this and that kind of dispute. You see bombing here, kidding there, and so on. Now, in, I mean, in Syria, it's happening again. It's just like a, a mind boggling and also uh, stressful, right? But I would suggest you to look at this a little from a little distance away, sort of take a longer view, so zoom out a little bit. I would suggest what we have today is not by any chance necessarily the worst at all uh, compared to many other uh, episodes of history in the past, right? What we are witnessing probably is like zigzagging again. Uh, we move forward all the zigzagging, right? Uh, the globalization uh, movement may be facing a little pause somewhat, right? Uh, represented by US politics and by Brexit, you know, British are leaving EU, and by now the trade war and so on, right? Uh, we need a little adjustment, maybe, right? Uh, I'm confident in the future, uh, human beings will figure out a better way to manage ourselves than the past, right? But if you look at all these hard indicators, uh, we are in an irreversible trajectory to progress ever since, right? Abject poverty, uh, human rights abuse, people die from natural disasters, 
people with a uh, life expectancy, expectancy, all in the right direction, all moving good, despite all this kind of uh, headline news, right? There may be some adjustment. Um, but it's no guarantee that in the future, history will not repeat its ugly past, right? Unlike in Hollywood, like I'm currently working on, unlike in Hollywood, in real history, good guys or us don't always win, right? Oftentimes, bad guys win. And that's the worrisome part. You know? So the current uh, situation may be just a you know, cyclical thing, maybe just zigzagging and kind of thing, or maybe an indication for some uh, bad things coming. The stuff hit the fan, right? In Chinese history, for example, I'm more familiar with the history of Chinese world, Chinese world the eastern part of the Eurasian continent. There were repeatedly terrible things that happened to reverse civilization, to be exact. When the Mongol cavalry invaded, when Manchus conquered, Chinese history literally turned back, right? Will that happen on the world, uh, like a global scale? No guarantee, right? Again, as I said, unlike in Hollywood, uh, there's no guarantee uh, we will always win, or good guys will always win. That's only Hollywood, right? The good guys, the good girls always get their loved ones and happily after. That's uh, fantasy, usually. Reality is just kind of to the contrary. So maybe the sign, we don't know yet. But again, I want to uh, sort of commend your, your observation. I want to give you a little injection of confidence that I think uh, things are moving in the right direction, even though uh, in short run, we're going to have some kind of a tough time, a tough patches to pass. It's almost, some people actually are talking about right now, it's almost like a world in 1930s. What happened in the 1930s? Great Depression, the coming of World War II. But we didn't know. Only a few years later, after the end of World War II, human civilization really qualitatively took off. Right? The past 70 years is the best time of human history, human civilization. No question asked, no quarrels. If anybody said today's worse than the 1920s, I beg her you know, for different. I mean, you, uh, I beg her to defer. You can, all numbers, scientific innovation, medicine, food, and just the size of human population. Everything's better. So if there's some kind of rough pages down the road, a like new Cold War, even kind of hot war, I, I think human civilization will eventually prevail. It's just the one time, there's no guarantee. Right? And that's kind of philosophical. Uh, for young people, try to think of romantic stuff. Right? Don't be too philosophical. But you know, it's good. It's good to, to hear that. Maybe last question? Yeah. One more question? Yes. Oh, any, any other, so since you asked before, any, any other question uh, in, from the audience? We don't have many uh, uh, women ask questions, right? Uh, come on. Yeah. No? Nobody? All right, you go. Yeah. Obviously, uh, Xinjiang is mm -hmm. in the news. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, the Western kind of looks, you know, at it as maybe, you know, the, as the Chinese kind of <laughs> suppressing the Chinese. Um, what's kind of the story, you know, behind that? Yeah. The other side. It, it is a, a, a very tough issue right now going on in Xinjiang. As I said, one-sixth of Chinese territory, huge place, relatively few population. Uh, the Uyghurs and other Muslims in Xinjiang are kind of a target of government uh, suppression, if you will. And if you uh, have been following, you probably heard about the education camps, right? That many people are um, put there to go through mandatory education, try to shake their uh, religious affiliation and faith, right? Uh, so far, it's pretty uh, uh, depressing to watch that. Uh, in my opinion, I'm, uh, I'm not necessarily worried just about that. I'm also worried about, uh, for the PRC, which has controlled Xinjiang for 70 years now, uh, seems seem to, seem, seem, seem to be less tranquil than before, right? It's getting worse. That's kind of a bad sign. And be, besides, 70 years ago, the Han, major Han people in Xinjiang, their population is only 5%. Now, it's 45%. Yet, the situation is still kind of unstable, right? still kind of bad. That seems to be indicating to me a kind of a deficit or flaws of governance over there. That's bad news, right? And the final point on that one is I uh, asked some uh, diplomats from Muslim countries around the world, from uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, from Gulf states, uh, why the Muslim world has been relatively quiet on Xinjiang issue. Even Turkey has been quiet, because the Uyghurs are Turkic people, right? They speak Turkey language, right? Why are they so, so quiet, you know, since uh, over, so supposedly a million Uyghurs now are put in education camps, right? Why are they so quiet? Uh, variety of answers. 
the most convincing answer is the Chinese government is spending heavily in those Muslim countries, especially Central Asian Muslim countries, right, to acquire people, uh, to buy friends. Uh, so I guess uh, money can buy a lot of things, and sometimes people say you cannot buy love. Uh, I don't know, maybe money can buy love too, you know, who knows, right? So as long as the Chinese are spending quite a bit in those countries helping them, uh, the overseas criticisms may be uh, less severe. But if the money is lifted, related to a trade war again with the United States, uh, things may change. But it is a worrisome picture. And uh, you hear a lot of uh, horrific anecdotes about Han people and Uyghurs in Xinjiang literally stabbing each other, literally, right? Uh, a single uh, Han tourist uh, also advised to be, would be dangerous to working in the street of Kashgar, for example. I wanted to visit Kashgar when I was in Xinjiang. They always advise against go there, unless you go with a big group. Right? Otherwise, you could get stabbed, literally, and vice versa. That kind of uh, animosity is bad. It's a bad sign, right? It's something failed. Something is not working, right? This kind of a high-pressured uh, policy, where it work, we don't know. But at least it helps reduce the terrorist activities, that's for sure. But whether it work to uh, pacify the whole region, we don't know. Uh, we have to wait and see. It is a kind of worrisome sign. Yes. All right. Others? All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I hope you uh, can uh, uh, join me uh, by giving Dr. Wang another round of applause. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank uh, you. I, I certainly hope that this kind of conversation uh, can uh, continue uh, on, on campus, and then I'm sure it will, it will uh, continue. Thank you. Uh, thanks again. Thank, thank you, Morris. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I know I have learned a lot. And I know I want to go to Beijing <laughs> because it's so beautiful. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I, and just to say thank you to um, our speaker today, coming all the way from um, the big ATL <laughs> to us in Auburn to educate us. I wanted to um, give you this gift. Oh, thank you. From the Office of International Programs. Thank you, thank thank you, you so you. much. Thank you. And to our very own moderator. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to your um, coming to our other programs. Please make sure you've signed up, signed in before you go, and we'll see you at the next program. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.